Welcome everyone. Today we have uh, Professor Ivo Białyński Birula, so one of the, I would say, two founders of our institute. Uh, he is working mostly in the field of quantum electrodynamics, uh, quantum optics, also atomic physics. Uh, professor received numerous awards for his achievements, including uh, the Alexander von Humboldt Award and also the uh, prize of the Foundation for Polish Science, which is sometimes called the Polish Nobel Prize. And last year, the Smoluchowski Medal. Uh, he's still very active, so I would like to say that uh, now we have evaluation of the Institute for the last five years. So Professor filled his lot with uh, the most profitable publications uh, from the evaluation point of view. Oh. Uh, and today we'll hear a talk about how many photons are attached to a hydrogen atom. So, Professor, please, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. When I first uh, asked this question, my wife said that it sounds like something that was very popular in medieval age, how many angels can fit on the tip of a pin. Well, I will try to show you that there is some physics, even though the numbers maybe are not very exciting, but I believe that this is a sound problem which at least can be asked and the answer can be given. So I have taken the hydrogen atom because it's the simplest. However, at the end, I will mention what happens when we continue this analysis to other atoms. And it has some charge con distribution because the proton is very small inside and the electron has a wave function which extends, uh, roughly speaking, around the Bohr radius. And one may calculate the mean number of photons that corresponds to the charge and current probability distributions. So it will not be the number of photons, but the, uh, rather the average number of photons because it is based on probabilistic interpretation of quantum mechanics. Well, as I mentioned already, the number is disappointingly small, but it's growing with Z. But the reason I am talking about this is that I believe that there are some other issues here, which are closely connected, and they might be of interest to all of you. So the starting point of all this calculation is a formula that I believe many people may want to know because it is just a sound physics. It is the a number of photons which is associated with a given electromagnetic field. I am using sort of peculiar units here, but that is what makes more sense in this context. Namely, I am using the units for the electric and magnetic field vectors, purely geometrical, the meter squared in the denominator. So these are the units and these units are related to physical fields, as I have written here, just simply by dividing the D field by the charge and dividing the H field by charge and the speed of light. This formula here was derived by Zeldovich, Jakob Borisovich Zeldovich, whom I happen to know personally. He visited us in our house and let me mention Zeldovich here because he deserves here some mention. This is a picture of Zeldovich with somebody I'm sure you know. And Jakub Borisovich was born yesterday, but in 1914. So it's also a good date to mention him. And he worked on many subjects from 31 to 37. He worked in physical chemistry. It might be of interest to know that he never entered the undergraduate university study. When he finished high school, he went directly and become a laboratory help in the Institute of Physical Chemistry. And then after three years, 
he became his doctoral, I mean, candidate in physics studies, omitting completely the university education. From 47 to 63, he worked on nuclear physics and elementary particles. And at the end of his life, he worked on astrophysics and cosmology. And this is an excerpt from the obituary that was written by Vitaly Lazarevich Ginzburg. Zeldovich can most accurately be described as a theoretical physicist of broad universal profile. Feynman, Landau, and only a few others belong to this category. The author of this obituary, Ginsburg, I think also belonged to this category. So, so much for Ginsburg. And now we go further. Very strange way to change pages. Well, this functional is worth knowing because he has this functional has many interesting properties. It looks not relativistic. The space, of course, is separated from time, etc. But this object that I have shown you is not only invariant under Lorentz transformations. Of course, it is invariant, obviously, under rotations, because it's expressed in with the help of scalar products of ordinary vectors but it is invariant under conformal transformation. It plays the role of a norm of the photon wave function. It is closely related to the Wigner functional of the electromagnetic field. And it may also have some applications in cosmology when you want really to know something about the number of photons and their relation to the electromagnetic fields in the cosmos. So now I go to the next slide in this strange way. And before I proceed with the main topic, I will convert the Zeldovich formula into the Fourier space because this is much more convenient. And there is this thing you can check by yourself that one over R minus R prime squared, which occurs in the Zeldovich formula can be written as an Fourier integral, and when you do that, and when you reverse the order of integrations, you first integrate over R and R prime, and then the remaining integral is in Fourier space, and it has a nice form. As now you can see the invariance much better because the volume element D3K divided by the modulus of K is a relativistic invariant. And now this, these objects are also relativistic invariant. Well, this formula is also useful if you want to understand where does the Zeldovich formula come from? Well, everybody can easily check that the formula for the energy in terms of Fourier transforms is this one given here. And this formula uh, now can lead to the formula for the number of photons in the following way. If we know the energy here, the total energy, we get the number of photons by dividing by the energy for each mode. So the next step is to do the following, namely to divide this by the HCK for each mode, and then by again going in the opposite direction, we reverse the path and we come to the Zeldovich formula when we transform the new formula in momentum space into the formula in position space. So this is how one can get it without going through a rather complicated derivation that can be found in the Zeldovich paper. It was published in the Claudia Academy, no very popular journal where many important things were published, but now- How about the contribution from the longitudinal part of electromagnetic field? There is no longitudinal part. 
of the electromagnetic field because in free field you have ah, okay okay no charges okay okay you only have longitudinal when you have coulomb sure 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 so now we go to the next slide here and we are ready now to calculate the average number of photons which are attached to the ground state <coughs> because we know the electromagnetic field and we know the electromagnetic field because we know the hydrogen wave functions. And I will use the Dirac equation, even though it's a bit more complicated, but it deals at the same time with electricity and magnetism. When you do it the non-relativistic way, then uh, you would have to use the Pauli equation and it is not really any simpler. And formulas, as you will see in a moment, are not that complicated. I could do almost everything analytic. So now we go to the next slide. And here it is. Here is the formula for the Dirac spinner for the ground state. Well, the ground state actually is degenerate. There are two states that differ in the value of the quantum number Jz, the total angular momentum. It could be positive or negative. And these two states have the same energy. Of course, this energy is later split by hyperfine interactions, but this is a very minute fact. And here it is for the positive value of Jc. So what do we hear here? We hear here uh, have a rather neat formula. It of course is a stationary state. So dependence of the energy is harmonic. Then we have the modulus of the space distance and the formula is, as you see here, this is in the Dirac representation. So the upper components of the Dirac the spinner and the lower components uh, are characterized by the fact that upper components are large, whereas the lower components are smaller by the factor of alpha in front of them. Well, it, it, gamma is a very convenient combination. It's one minus alpha squared. A lambda C in this formula is just the reduced electron Compton wavelength. Well, let's proceed then. I will use this wave function, this B spinner, now to construct the interesting objects. Namely, I take the charge density rho and the probability current and city J. And here are the formulas. As you see, they're much simpler than the original wave function. Many things have were just shortened in this formula. And now, since we have the charge density and we have the current density, and the thing is stationary, I go back to Maxwell equations. And the Maxwell equations in those units that I'm using, the geometrical units for the electric and magnetic field, they reduce to two equations, the divergence of D. And here, of course, there is the longitudinal part because now I have sources that were not present in the formula of Bildovit, but now I have sources. And there is the Ampere's law that the curl of H is equal to the current divided by C. So here we have everything in geometrical units. The charges do not appear because of the choice of our unit. So if I have rho now, I could do many things with this rho. I could solve these equations and these solutions can be obtained because of the spherical symmetry to a large extent. So one could find the space distribution of D and H. However, 
this is not what I need because I need the photon number and I express the photon number in terms of Fourier transform. Then I will just convert these equations into the Fourier space. And then I don't have to solve differential equations because I have algebraic equations to solve, which greatly simplifies the whole procedure. And this excuse is- me, Excuse me, don't you have yes. to add a delta function for the charge of the proton? Wait, wait, wait. So you are you sure that you have a neutral, electrical no, neutral? Delta function, no, delta function would not do. I will explain this in a moment. Very interesting remark, and it will be addressed in a moment. So uh, one can, as I said, one can solve in terms of potentials. And these are relatively simple formulas. The equations then become ordinary differential equations in the variable r. We can find phi and a r. But as I said, this is not what I need. I need the Fourier representation. And therefore, here I go. And I have this. This is something just to show you that's quite interesting, but it will not be of much relevance. This is the picture of the magnetic field of the hydrogen state of the electron. And it is clearly something that reminds us of a magnet. This is the magnetic field of a magnet, certainly. So now we know that electron is like a tiny magnet. Here. Okay, let's go further to the part that is of interest. This, these are the algebraic equations in Fourier space, and the solutions of these equations are given in these simple formulas. There's no need to solve any differential equations. And now I will forget because I will forget the magnetism because it's much smaller. The current is alpha times smaller than the charge. Therefore, the effects will be even smaller than what we can expect for the electric field. But of course, can be calculated There's no problem. As I have shown you, I can calculate the magnetic field without much effort. So now I go further. And here is rho translated into momentum space. It turns out that this Fourier transformation can be analytically performed. And here is the formula, which is not complicated. It is quite simple when you use a new variable Q, which is dimensionless variable, the Compton wavelength times K divided by two alpha. This is my definition of alpha of Q. And rho of K depends on K through Q. And it's quite simple. The value at K, this is important, at K equals zero is two pi to the power of minus three halves, which comes from the conventional definition of the Fourier transform. And now there's a problem that was already asked. If I substitute this formula into the formula of Zeldovich in momentum space, you remember this K in the denominator. And this leads to infrared catastrophe because I have the integral dk over k, which diverges logarithmically. So I get infinite number of photons. Most of them are infrared photons. So what went wrong? And this is what went wrong is just that I forgot about the proton, which is sitting there in the middle of the atom and it compensates the charge. When you go far away from the atom, 
you don't see the electric field because it's screened. The electron screens the charge of the proton. And this field goes down in position space much faster, which means that in momentum space, the infrared catastrophe is happily avoided. So we are led to the following formula now, which we must do. The atoms are electrically neutral on the whole, so there is no catastrophe. And the shape of the proton turns out to be not important. I cannot use delta function because that would produce infinite number of protons due to the singularity at the center. So I have to choose some model of the proton and it does not really depend since proton is much smaller than the Compton wavelength. It's about three orders of magnitude smaller than the Compton wavelength. It doesn't matter whether I use the sharp boundary or I use the Gaussian model or anything else. It gives about the same value. And this is how I proceed now to calculate the number of photons. Here is the formula for the number of photons, which duly shows the cancellation of infrared infinities because there is a charge of the proton in momentum space. There is a charge density in momentum space of the electron. And I have to take difference because they have opposite charges. And since at the origin, they are equal to the same value, which I have shown before, two pi to the power of minus three halves. Therefore, at the origin, the numerator vanishes and this cures our infinity. And this integral cannot be evaluated analytically because it has some complicated rather function, not, I mean, not too complicated, but the analytic formula does not exist, but the Mathematica does it in fractions of a second. And this integral can be evaluated analytically. And the analytical value is small. I'm sorry for that. And it's just <laughs> 25 thousandths of a photon connected with the hydrogen atom. So I have to apologize for hydrogen. And I can say now that it's not so bad because it, this number depends crucially on the atomic number Z. So one can get many, many more photons if I increase and I go to higher, for example, lead would have a lot of photons, but of course the calculations now are too complicated to be worth doing. I would have to choose some atomic orbitals and uh, all I could do now with, without going into great pains, I suppose that the Pauli principle is not obeyed so all electrons are in the same ground state, they're bosons, say. And then our formula for N is simply multiplied by Z squared because I have this square of two densities and each density is multiplied by Z. So I get Z squared. And on the right, on the next transparency here, I see the curve. This curve is a plot of the dependence on N in this crude, very crude model dependence of N on Z. So it can even get as many photons as 200 if I go to those exotic elements. Well, for, for lead, which has Z equals 82, it's still a good number 100. So lead has 100 photons 
attached to it. And uh, that's what it is. This zero here is not quite zero, but 25 thousandths of a photon. But as you see, the situation increases. So that's- How about ions? Well, no, no, not, nothing. No, I'm talking about, I cannot have ions because then I would have infrared infinity. Then what would be- no, ions are so what does it mean physically? Are there really so many photons around ions? Infinitely many photons because of infrared divergence, because ionic charge extends to infinity. You have to screen the charge. You have to place ion in the plasma, say, and then you have screening, and then the number yes. of photons yes. is finite. And what will change if you take positronium? Uh, what will change? The number will be still tiny because then I don't have this increase with the number Z. This will be, I would say, of the order of uh, what I have for the hydrogen. So it will be still a minute number of photons. But the, the, I, the only thing I wanted to convey in my talk is this very idea. First idea is there is a number of photons which is associated with the electromagnetic field. That's number one. Number two is electrons and protons and all the constituents of atoms and molecules are charged. They do not have definite charge, but they have a charge distribution, which is governed by the law of probability in quantum mechanics. So since I have the probabilistic distribution of the charge, I can calculate the probabilistic distribution of the photon number. I have to integrate over all configurations according to the probability law, and I get a definite average number of photons for each neutral object, for charged objects, as I said, I cannot give a number because this number is infinite due to the extension of the electric field to infinity, which is the fall off is too weak to give the finite number of photons. I have a question. Uh, yes. Maybe let's first thank the speaker for okay. this talk. And then I think now we can officially start this part with questions. So Mikolai, please, you are the first now. Uh, what happens if you consider excited state, especially uh, very high, the Rydberg atoms with very high uh, numbers. I, I expect that since the atom becomes very large, you would have increasing number of photons. No, because uh, when I, th this comes roughly from the uncertain relation. When I extend the atom in space, I shrink it in momentum space. So uh, this doesn't help any. The, the Fourier part will not really significantly increase, especially since most of the uh, photon number comes from small values of P, which are not here increased when I take the spatial extension. Thank you. I see the right hand of Tai Hun Li. So Tai, please. Uh, I wonder the eigenstate of a photon number is uh, like uh, same as um, uh, sorry actually you can simultaneously actually measure a number of a photon at the same time the energy of a hydrogen atom. Uh, well, since this is the probability distribution, I can avoid uh, the problems. I have, as I said, I have a charge distribution, which is probabilistic. Right. I calculate the probabilistic electromagnetic field, which is due to this probabilistic charge and magnetic moment distribution. And I, then I average over all configurations 
and I get a number for the average number of photons, avoiding the question of simultaneous measuring of something. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> so now I see the- You are question. muted. Oh, you, uh, you are still muted, sir. Oh, now, okay. Yes, uh, uh, thanks for a nice talk. Uh, I have a question somewhat related to the, to the ions. So, uh, I, as you said, uh, would a purely, let's say, positive ion or negative charged ion, we have infrared divergence. So, uh, would say we have maybe an infinite number of photons. But suppose now you take these two isolated charges, or uh, the, the proton and the electron, and move them together. So my question is, where would this supposed infinity of photons go? Because the bound state now has an associated number, as you said, of less than a, two and a half thousand of a photon. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, I don't quite uh, understand your question. You want to take the hydrogen atom in? So I, I want to take a proton and an electron. So yes. So. For, for each of them individually, we have this infrared divergence. Of no, 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 wait, 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 wait. One problem. If you consider both of them in the same space, then of course you don't have infrared, even though they are far apart. When you go to true infinity, the charge is still screened. Mm -hmm. So this problem does not occur if you consider simultaneously proton and electron in the same space time. Okay. And then uh, it's a dipole. Okay, in other words, it's a dipole then if you have them separated and the dipole field drops off faster than the field of a Coulomb charge. Mm -hmm. And then photons which have wavelength much larger than the size of a dipole cannot resolve it. That's right. That's that's right. a physical picture of it yes and then as so as as we change so if we have this dipole or i know a bound state of large dimensions then by by changing the uh, the state Distance. of the, 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 yes. the so the, yes. the photons would be what uh, radiated away How no 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 they are not radiated if you have a stationary state uh -huh. if you have moving electron and proton, it's a different story, then you have to take into account the time dependence. However, if it is a stationary charge distribution, time independent, then of course you are right that when they are separated by a big distance, then the number increases, the number of photons increases. Mm -hmm. But uh, can this associated number be measured? Like, can we measure only differences or can we expect to measure the total number <laughs> because associated is very vague notion. <laughs> what does That's a very good question. The question is even uh, simpler. The question is, can we measure the electromagnetic field which is due to this charge distribution? And the answer, as I see it, is very simple. Of course we measure it. When you uh, scatter an electron of a hydrogen atom, then the electron feels the electromagnetic field. When you do it in terms of Feynman diagrams, you see a photon line, which is connected the moving electron with the constituents of the atom. So you really are testing the electromagnetic field surrounding the atom because the particle that is flying by can only feel the electromagnetic field, does not feel directly the, the the electron, but with the help of the electromagnetic field. Okay, thank you. Okay, do we have- I'm still not convinced that in the construction in which you are adding or rather subtracting contributions from the electronic cloud and from proton, then at the end, your field is really radiation field. Uh, well, I do not say that I'm treating the radiation field. I am just using the formula, which is universal. It, the formula of Zeldovich does not say whether these are 
photons as the transverse photons or any other photons, the formula depends on the electric and magnetic field and it's universal. One may say this is an extrapolation of this formula to all cases, including those that fields do not depend on space time, on time. So in other words, even the most sensitive detector would never click for sure at the rate associated with this number. Uh, that uh, is how you mean that the, direct, that the detector cannot click because for a detector to click, one must yeah, see, a, must absorb a photon. Exactly. Yes, but the detection of electric field is not necessarily, we know how to measure very small magnetic fields, for example, sure. extremely small magnetic fields, even though these are static magnetic. Yes, 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 no, I agree with that. Uh, I agree that, of course, in principle, if you had the sufficiently sensitive device, we could test the electromagnetic field inside the atom, that's fine with the scattering process and so on and so on. Uh, what worries me is whether all these effects that you are talking about should be really interpreted as the number of photons. The energy, of course. Uh, well, I would say it's borders on a philosophical question. <laughs> yes. is, there, yeah, is there something, and, is there something else in the electromagnetic field which is not represented by photons? And I do not think so by the following argument. Uh, if you vary the field with the characteristic time, which is of the order of the age of the universe, you do have photons. So the question of continuity in some way is important here. If it is true for photons, which are extremely long wave, then it should by continuity. Physics, of course, is an approximate science. So if this is true for any large time variation, uh, I mean, with, with large time scale, then it's practically the same as for the static field. Otherwise, you would say that there are two kinds of electromagnetism. One is static and the other is dynamic, which I don't And that think. is somehow what experiment is telling. That there are two kinds. Well, sure. you know, well, uh, then, then, then there's a clash with relativity in the following sense. The way to do it then mathematically is to introduce two kinds of interactions. The interaction via the exchange of transverse photons and the interaction via Coulomb interaction. And these two terms enter into the description. And then if you keep them separate, you don't see the Lorentz invariance because Coulomb field is instantaneous. Yes. And transverse photons are also defined in a certain coordinate system. And as was noticed by Feynman, that was one of the very interesting discoveries of Feynman, when you put the Coulomb and the transverse part together, a miracle happens due to the current conservation. There is a contribution from the Coulomb field, which is non-relativistic, canceling the contribution from the transverse field, which is also non-relativistic, and the beautiful form of the Feynman propagator, which contains G mu nu, emerges. Well, I, yes, I agree that actually uh, uh, when I think of splitting the field into the static and, 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 and photonic parts, then it also depends on the gauge, which again shows- No, 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 no. There is no, is not there's really no dependence unique. on the gauge. Anything that is physical does not depend on gauge. Exactly, There's that's no... what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying, because, because I know that for two different gauges, I could have different ways of splitting the same purely exactly relativistic field into the, into the static part and the, and the photons, then it means that the splitting is, of course, not physical. 
No, I, but what I'm saying is now is that's in agreement with what you have said. I, I disagree to the extent that the splitting I mentioned is not gauge dependent. This is the splitting in the Coulomb part, which is clearly gauge invariant, and the splitting into the transverse photons, which are also gauge invariant. Because when you apply the gauge transformation, they are no longer long, they pick up a longitudinal part. So if I believe that photons are transversal, obviously, then the splitting, which I mentioned, does not depend on the gauge. It, it does depend on the coordinate system. Okay, okay, I, I have some, some extra things about it, which I have even written, but, but it's probably I know, going to be I, I know that one can bring in the gauge invariance into play here, but it's not necessary because one can do without mentioning okay, gauge. That's, that's still possible. the same that's, problem. Yes. Okay, do we have more questions? If not, then I propose to speak to thanks to the speaker again. Thank you for listening.